Hello. Am I mic'd on? Can everyone hear okay? Yes. No? Can we test you? One, two, three? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Three? Yeah. Yes? Hi. Sorry. Good. Okay. <laughs> Pay attention to you. So, and Azim, where are you? Because I want to make sure we run to time, so make sure you jump in, Jack, when we need to wrap up. I would love to encourage this group to keep it real because it's been very, very theoretical. We've got some huge brains in the room. And I want to really make it so that we all leave this conversation understanding what AI will allow us to do with regards to cybersecurity that we cannot do now. Because people are getting hacked right, left, and center. We know that even the NSA had problems keeping its cyber arsenal secure. All right, so thanks, Shadow Brokers, for that. We've had WannaCry, we had NotPetya. We've got companies scared all over the world, not knowing how to protect themselves. And we've got individuals not understanding what this means. Yet we're also told that some of the biggest risks are insider threat, right? Or phishing or spear phishing. So what we really need to understand, I think, when we leave this, is how does AI make this better? So I'm going to throw this to you now just to warm you up, and then we're going to trot through it. <laughs> so Dave, easy question. Um, I think AI will change absolutely everything that we're already doing in cybersecurity and every facet of it will change. So we all have email defenses, whether that's because we're using Gmail or because we have uh, BBC emails or, or whatever. And uh, right now they're, they're pretty dumb. They make decisions based on what yesterday's attacks look like and try and stop them from being repeated. But as we know, there is enormous creativity in, in attacks that are created. So. I think we will get email defenses that recognize how you and I talk to each other, a bit the opposite of what I was talking about in my presentation that says, this doesn't sound like Stephanie, and, or this isn't how Dave would contact you, and there's something fishy about that attachment. Um, and I think those same ideas will be applied to every part of our digital world, how we use data. Maybe we're using a load of data and the system says, I think you're using data a bit strangely there, Dave. You seem to be hoovering it all up and squirting it out to uh, your personal Dropbox, and I'm just not going to allow that in future. So uh, I think AI will change absolutely everything, but not straight away. It's going to come out uneven. OK, I'm going to follow up with you really quickly there. If AI is going to change absolutely everything, and we all want to invest and make money off of that and get on it, when, how quickly? Like three years, five, 10, tomorrow? I think it's changing now. I mm -hmm. think the. Um, every product from firewalls to the email defenses to the way that we defend our laptops to the, the way we protect our big factories and even stuff in space are all being developed now, not necessarily brilliantly, so there's a lot of room for investing and trying new ideas and competing in that space, but there's no way that cybersecurity looks the same in five years, absolutely no way. Great, thank you. Robert, we talked yesterday a bit, and I want to sort of bring this up in regards to this conversation, and you mentioned an AI arms race. Mm. Are we scared? Yeah, I am. OK, why are we scared? Because um, I was saying, AI is this catalytic process. It will accelerate everything. It's like, you know, like the previous talks about proteins, enzymes, and the modeling of those. So the question is, how, it's going to create business opportunities. There will definitely be opportunities for companies that can provide intelligent services, intelligent personal protection services. It's like Dave was saying, you know, in the future, very soon, you're going to need two-factor authentication for every social interaction. I'm not actually sure you're you, but... I'm not sure I'm me. Yeah, but I'll, yeah, I'll take the, you know, physically, I'll take that on, on face value. But literally, you know, in the future, mm -hmm. imagine every phone call, every email, you have to use two-factor two authentication. It's going to be very tedious. So we're going to need intelligent capability to manage improve and verify every interaction, which is it's be interesting how that plays out. Um. OK, and from your perspective as a chief research scientist, how do you see AI is going to transform cybersecurity? So you know, practically on the ground. I, th I think the biggest issue is this ability to mimic. So the ability of the attacking groups to mimic normal behavior, normal protocols. The problem is human beings are fundamentally trusting. I mean, the biggest, always the biggest uh, challenge to any security process is social engineering. You, know, you may have the best firewall on the planet Earth, but I guarantee in some level I can socially engineer into an organization because people will trust things. Once you build the right relationships, they will trust you. And AI will do that. It will mimic those normal human relationship processes. And then the, the human beings that are not defended or trained properly will just let the thing in. And that's, the, that's a big worry. And how you 
how you educate retrain people to understand that and how you create the automated defenses that can cope with that kind of very sophisticated tech mechanism is a, is a challenge. It's a re open research challenge, definitely. Okay. We're going to come back to that. I want to make sure that we get Maria Rosaria in with her fantastic presentation that we just had and the fact that we're not just dealing with criminal actors, we're dealing with sovereign state actors as well. So how does AI ch change that calculus from your perspective? What's going to be different and how can we protect ourselves using it? But how will those actors use AI against us? So generally speaking, AI will impact cybersecurity in, in one way also, which is allow software verification and validation or system verification and validation before, better than we have ever done it before. So it will be easy to understand what are the boundaries and the security limitations of the systems that we develop. We don't have to forget that it's not a one-way thing, it's an interaction. So good guys get AI, bad guys get AI. Good guys improve AI, bad guys improve AI. So it's a dynamic and this will take us somewhere. And this is also true when it comes to states. Uh, states will are going to use AI to protect themselves, to protect critical infrastructures. As we're seeing critical infrastructures, we're talking about water plants, electricity plants. Uh, they can be targeted by cyber means. Russia did it versus the US uh, in March. They've done it in Ukraine. They've done it in Georgia. Uh, and the risk that we find there is that these conflicts will become much quicker. And we won't have a human on the loop understanding what's happening at every stage. And the very risk that we might face at some point is that things go out of end array. And we, we end up in a situation which is escalating much farther than we would have liked, both sides would have liked. And it will be difficult to recover from there because it's very quick, it's very automated, it's much, very much of a black box. And so it's hard to understand what consequences could really happen once, this, once two AI systems are interacting one with the other. Okay. Two questions that I'd like you to each address in turn. The first is, who is ahead on AI? Who's leading? Is it the private sector or is it governments? And then second, if we're looking to countries specifically, who are the leading countries in AI with regards to cybersecurity? I want to say super targeted here. So, Dave. Um, taking the second one first, I think the leading countries uh, applying AI to cybersecurity and just generally the leading countries in cybersecurity are uh, US, Israel, UK, France, China, almost certainly Russia, although it's quite opaque to work that out. Uh, when you look at who the, the strengths are, it's those countries and completely tied into uh, Maria Rosa's, uh, Rosario's talk, the that matches neatly with who's the best at offense. So when mm. we talk about the typical um, offenders, to reuse your, uh, uh, your word, same group of countries. Okay, and private sector versus government, um, any interplay there? I'm sure there's absolutely loads of interplay. I, th I guess um, my gut feel is government has more data than anyone else and that tends to win out eventually when you're dealing with AI. The more data that you have, um, the better that you can perform. But, you know, these days you look at some organizations in the private sector, the innovation might be coming from smaller companies or new companies, but you've also got the Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon monster companies and Alibaba and others uh, around the world too that also have a lot of data. So very difficult to measure, but I suspect the private sector has the edge today, but that won't continue. Fascinating, thank you. Robert? Yeah, I think certainly it's the pace of innovation for the private sector is significantly faster than the government sector in my experience. Um, but yes, the government has the core data that's probably most relevant to state on state interaction. Hmm. Um, my, my key concern going forward <clears throat> is when things get out of control. So like last year we had WannaCry, which was a state tool that was control was lost of. So, as Reza was saying, as we go to the point of states will go down this path, they will lose control of that capability at various points. And then it will leak into the, you know, the civil hacking community who will then use it for criminal purposes. And that's going to be very difficult to deal with. Hmm. And what are your thoughts on the private sector again? That, and I, I ask this specifically because we just saw, I'm sure everyone here in the room was following Google not wanting to use AI for warfare technology, and there's this big debate about it, right? So what happens if certain countries have companies that will make that decision versus certain countries, I don't need to name one, I'm sure we can all imagine them, uh, have countries where that's perhaps not 
a debate. It's not an issue. So that tension. Sure. Well, I, I made a point. I was talking to Esther Dyson yesterday about this issue of a cultural mirror. The whole of AI is effectively going to be a cultural mirror to each you know, major culture on the planet. And different cultures are going to have different takes on this, and it's going to be echoed into all the AI they create. And that'll be the same for their business attitudes towards the AI. So in the US, you're seeing an interesting West Coast, East Coast dynamic. It depends which side of the US you're talking about, which is interesting. It's just one country, but you've got a very polarized perspective on how AI should be used. Hmm. What I've seen. Maria Rosaria. So I think that to, to answer to your first questions, private versus public, um, with an image, when you have a representative of US government defense forces flying to San Francisco to talk to big ICT companies, then you have the answer to your questions. States have data, but innovation doesn't happen uh, in, in states or quarters. The, the human value goes to private companies. They pay better salaries, better, better benefits. That's a problem that we have in academia, we have in states. So that's what, what we're seeing. But it's interesting because it goes back to the transformative power of these technologies. We have, the, your question makes sense because until yesterday, you had the state capabilities which would, in many areas, uh, you know, be much more refined than private sector capabilities. When it comes to cyber or to digital, this is not anymore the case. And what we would see is exactly this, is a compenetration, is a, a collaboration of the, two, uh, of, the two, of the two elements. So much so that when you think about China and the grand plan that China has for AI, well, the key words there is fusion. They are not having military and private sector working in parallel. They are having the two working together. And this is actually answering to your questions. It's not possible anymore to think about... Well, that's a cultural difference. It's a cultural difference. It's actually very much to your point. But there's a cultural difference that at some point will contaminate also this side of the world if we want to stay uh, head of the game or part of the game. And I support your point about uh, you know, losing control. We have seen it already. Um, Stuxnet, the virus, the worm that armed Stuxnet, which was designed to attack. So Stuxnet was well, a cyber attack against uh, um, nuclear centrifuges deployed in Iran. It was designed to attack a piece of software running a specific Siemens um, hardware. Install that, used for that thing. You will think that you know, it only works on that machine. I mean, I cannot sync my iPhone with my, with my Windows, a Windows machine. You will think that you know, a, a worm designed to attack this kind of machine will not be able to work anywhere else. It's been since uh, the worm was released on the dark web. It's been seen ever used by Russian criminals to uh, perform criminal, criminal acts. So it's about the next, well, the past six, seven years. So this malleability of the digital is something that we also have to keep in mind when we think about capabilities. Uh, yes, US, UK is leading. Israel is on top of the game. They've been there for quite a while. China's coming up. India's coming up. Russia's coming up. Because for cultural differences, they can collect much more data than we ever can. And they can use them much more freely than we can. So it's an interesting time coming ahead, I guess. Unless if you do this job. Yep. <laughs> do you think that um, companies, I'm going to just focus on big companies here, I'll, you know, the, the sort of NGO and SME sector is still important. But focusing on big companies, boards are already struggling to wrap their head around cybersecurity. What is the right amount that they need to spend in order to keep themselves safe? How do they know if they're being effective? Is it just a case of, like, we haven't been hacked yet, fingers crossed? Or are there ways that they can you know, have greater confidence? How does AI help them? What should boards be looking at to understand, is our cybersecurity strategy good, or do we need to beef it up? I'm not sure AI is the first place to start. I think if you are a board member of a mega firm, the, the place to start is, what gets me fired? I mean, seriously, as a question, um, if you're bottling soft drinks and you can't bottle soft drinks anymore, that probably gets you fired. The recipe to your soft drink, which t traditionally we would have said intellectual property theft is a cybersecurity problem, probably doesn't matter because, you know, we've heard all these bio talks, probably anyone can reverse engineer any soft drink on the brand, so, um, on the market. So I think understanding what's genuinely critical to your business, and rather than saying, absolutely everything needs to be secure from the receptionist on the front desk through to um, an, an executive in Starbucks on their laptop and say, well, I care about the soft drink bottling plants and I care about the lorries being able to know where to deliver all the soft drinks to is the best place to start if you're a board executive. How will AI help? Well, I think fundamentally AI is about handling complexity in a way that is far more capable than the linear programming era we're coming out of. And so 
when you think about the millions of devices we all have and the complex and unique people that we all are and, and all those interactions, AI almost certainly will help us to understand all of that, see if something strange and unusual is happening. Uh, but if you're a board member, you shouldn't start with the tech. You should start with what gets me fired and make sure you're asking the right questions of the tech people that work for you. OK. Does that keep us just focusing on compliance, though? Or is there a way to get ahead? No, okay. I, th I think Dave's right. So again, if you look at the biological analogy, if you start, you know, a person starts to get ill or get stressed, your body automatically responds by starting to protect your core organs, your brain, the things that you need to stay alive. It starts to sacrifice you know, the perimeter of your system, your very self. So as a business, you have to have identified what is your core? What are the things that stop, that you will not be trading next week if you don't protect? Okay. I don't, and what we could really use, be using AI for is to model your enterprise, you know, to really model what you have. Because often people don't know what they have, what the assets are, what the network actually is, or what actually is key. And then you can start to do proper, you know, using an AI model to build a, an accurate picture of what you actually rely on. What are the things you really need? And then protect those as your core cyber assets. Brilliant. Maria Reyes, are you? Well, I think that is the book perfectly right. Uh, it's not a, you know, it's not a cure for all sicknesses. And if you don't have strategies, if you don't have a vision and understanding of how you deploy, it's a tool that is it's not going to be worthless, but it's not going to be of much help. So understanding, yes, what is your core business? Understanding what's going to be arming your reputation if something happens. Because you might be working on soft drinks, but these days you might have also a lot of personal data. If those get hacked, it becomes problematic. So being strategic, as uh, you would expect that you know member of boards uh, are is crucial, uh, and then deploying it AI strategically is fundamental. Without forgetting one thing, it's about the human beings. It's about the employees and the customers. The moment in which we focus on AI and we forget why AI is good, mm -hmm. then we all start in trouble. I think that's probably a great note to end on. I'm going to ask one last question, and that is this: We hear with cybersecurity that people are your weakest link all the time. Does AI change that statement? I'm not sure people are the weakest link. I just think they're the uh, relationships that are attacked most, as, as, as Robert was explaining. What I think AI might be really good at for us all as individual people is cutting through the opaqueness and complexity of all the technology that goes on and surfacing up to us much better and clearer decisions. So if I get a, a fake email from Robert, then hopefully it says, this looks like it comes from Robert, but it doesn't sound like him, and it's a bit weird, and so uh, be careful about opening that attachment. That would be so much better than the weird alerts and pop-ups you get on computers these days uh, and would be really empowering for individual people. Yeah. And you're just ignoring my emails anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, true. I think that it is good that we trust AI, but we need to stop trusting AI in a blind way. Uh, we need to be uh, aware of risks, consequences, uh, and smart way of using it in a detrimental way, and you know, go back to human smartness as well. As well. So it's just not rely on the artificial intelligence. Let's use some of the organic one, and perhaps uh, that would be the best solution. Lovely. Well, that's a great note to end on. If you'll just join me in thanking our speakers.